I'm reading from Revelation chapter 3. Um, I'm reading of the letter that um, was written um, to Sardis. The message to the church in Sardis. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believe at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and His angels, that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. <clears throat> to the church of Philadelphia, and the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have, a, have but a little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, behold. I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. To try those who dwell on the earth, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own, my name. Who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful, and the true witnesses the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. To whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I, over, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. It starts out with, I know your name. <coughs> if you do a little research on that, that word name, in that spot, it's not talking about a physical name. Like, my name's Merck. Tammy, Gary, we all have a name. In this place, the meaning of the Greek or Hebrew is actually reputation. I know your reputation. The reputation I have, is it true or is it false? What do people know that know me? What do they say about me? I always thought I had a pretty good reputation. I never really got any real bad things. I didn't do drugs, didn't get in gangs, do any bank robberies, or murder anybody. I never spent one day in prison. But apparently over the years, I made a name for myself. I built a reputation. Because you know what people thought and said when they found out what I was doing, what I started doing about five years ago? When I started coming up here in this pulpit and started to preach. You're doing what? or a name that people would be surprised that I would become a preacher. Now, keep in mind, I never planned on that, being a preacher. That was the furthest thing from my mind. Just the other week I ran into someone that knew me. He says, you're what? So I had to think that name I have for myself is still out there. But maybe simply people don't think that I can change. I've heard people say it about others. I haven't told, heard them tell, say it about me, but about others. Well, I guess it can change. A person can make a change. Let's just wait and see how long it lasts. Maybe it's because they don't believe that Jesus Christ can make a change in someone's life. Maybe they don't believe they have faith in Jesus Christ when they enter into someone's heart has the ability and the power to change them. The person that I was, I am no longer. I'm alive in Jesus Christ. I know Jesus is where it's at. The church of service. Jesus says, you are all but dead. There may be a little bit of life left in you, but you're all but dead. Yes, at one time you had great activities, you had great wonderful programs. You did great, wonderful things in this church. You brought many sinners to Christ. You made a name for yourself as a church that was making Christians. And oh, how you showed the world the love of Jesus Christ. But now, you're just going through the motions. You go to church every Sunday morning, you sit in the pew. You pray, sing all the songs with great joy. Say all the right things. 
But there's no life. There's no Jesus. You're all but dead. How many churches do you know like that today? Too many. Too many, exactly. From the outside, you can see all kinds of activity going on. They have all kinds of programs happening. Man, that like church is alive for the Lord. They proclaim, come as you are. Jesus Christ accepts you. And so do we. Which is very true. Jesus Christ does accept everybody. And anybody. And we must accept them into the church. Because where else will they find out about the need of Jesus Christ in their life? But when you see them out on the street, you can't tell the difference between one that lives in the world and one that has Jesus Christ. Which puts a question mark, where is that sincerity of love for Jesus Christ? Where is the joy of the Lord? You can go to this church, feel good about yourself when you walk in. You can also feel good about yourself when you walk out. Doesn't matter what you did Saturday evening or Friday evening. Doesn't matter what you did the rest of the week. You can still feel good about yourself. Notice that this chapter starts out with Jesus introducing himself as the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The Holy Spirit. Jesus is asking this church, where's the Holy Spirit in your life? When you look at this church, all they are about is doing what has been done before. This has worked, so we're going to continue this. Yeah, we have a bulletin. You can open the bulletin up and you can see exactly where we go. What place everything happens. It's not wrong. As long as we don't get so caught up in doing things in, the, in this formal way that we lose sight of why you're really here. Why are you here? Anybody? Why are you here? Worshiping, praising God. To learn something about Jesus Christ. To love Him more. When looking at this church, all they are about doing is what has been done before. I said that already. And the churches had struggles and persecutions going on. The others did. But Sardis was spiritually dead. I'm guessing even Satan didn't bother to go there. His work was done. Is it a coincidence in Scripture that this dead church follows the ones who have allowed the sin into their lives and then have accepted that sin in their lives and thinking this is great. When you take the scriptures out of context, when you read just the scriptures that makes you feel good, it's so very easy to allow sin in your life, to allow just to justify the way you live. The things that you accept. We can say, because what Jesus said about the camel getting through the eye of a needle, 
It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get to heaven. We can say it is a sin to be rich. It is a sin to have lots of money. Is this true? What happened to Abraham? Isaac. Joseph. Solomon. According to Old Testament times, they were filthy rich. Were they not? What happened to them? When you study the scriptures, these people all had God's blessings in their life. So no, it's not a sin to be rich. I know your reputation. I know your works, the things you do. You're doing all the right things. When you look at the church of Laodicean, you see that here also Jesus is saying, I know what you're doing, and you're doing going through the motions. You're doing it on yourself. You think you're successful because of the bank account that you have. If you study a little history, this church, Lidosia, was rich. The town was rich. It was made up of rich people. They could do it all on their own. They didn't need God. They were very successful. If a problem comes up, you don't pray about it. You throw money at it. If you want a bigger congregation, you don't pray about it. You build a bigger, nicer, beautiful church. It makes it all smiles on the outside. But there's frowns on the inside. Where is the Holy Spirit? How is your soul? Notice that the church, Jesus, Jesus introduced himself as the faithful and true witness. And he says this church is lukewarm. And someone is lukewarm in their relationship with Jesus, Jesus Christ. Are we faithful to him? Are they really willing to live by the truth of the scriptures? Do they actually read and study the word of God? Maybe just enough to keep the dust off the cover. And be able to say just the right things and do the right things. The problem with being a lukewarm Christian. One cannot be faithful to Jesus, nor can they be faithful to the devil. Kind of stuck in the middle. Stuck in the middle with you. There's so much. Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, times of the past. They are stuck in the middle. They can't be happy in the world. But they have enough world that can't be joyful in Jesus Christ. And these people wonder why they don't feel the love of Jesus in their lives. But they can't get no satisfaction in the world. There's another song that says, can't get no satisfaction. They are stuck in the middle. No man's land. The devil don't want them because they have too much of Jesus Christ in them. But Jesus don't want them because there's too much devil in them. Also because they don't read the Bible the way they should because that butter hurts when it slices and cuts and dices. The sword of the Lord. You read that thing the whole way through. 
every word of it, not to skip the parts that make you feel good. Even me, it hurts. That's what God designed it to do. Because when we are not obedient, it tells us how to be obedient. The Laodiceans would have known exactly what Jesus, Christ, Jesus was talking about when he says about being lukewarm. Wanting to spit them out. They knew what it was like to drink warm water. This city didn't have its water supply. It owned its own water supply. So they piped through the viaduct from six miles away from a hot spring. Until it got to them, it wasn't hot and it wasn't cold. It was lukewarm. Have you ever tried when it's a hot day out, hot dust day outside and drink lukewarm water? Mm. Yeah, I see the expressions. It didn't have the heating power of hot water, and it didn't have the cool, refreshing power of cold water. James 2, James talks about faith being useless if there is no works. It says, faith without works is a dead faith. I will show you my faith by my works. This is what Jesus is getting at about being reborn. Yes, you're doing all the right things. You're doing all, saying all the right things. But these things, they are for your own glory. Not my glory. This is the same way the church at Sardis. You're doing all the right things, saying all the right things. You look alive. You look like there's something there. But in reality, you're dead inside. There's no love, there's no joy for the Lord inside. The works that you are doing mean nothing. You're just going through the motions. These two churches showed nothing of the love of Jesus Christ that comes through the Holy Spirit. There is no light shining for the world to see the love of Jesus Christ. While Jesus didn't have anything good to say, but the Edosian. He did say to Sardis, be watchful, strengthen the things which remain. Can you imagine sitting down with Jesus and having him tell you the things that you're doing are hopeless and they are helpless? There's nothing in you that you're doing that is worthwhile. There's nothing in you to rebuild from. The way you are, you make me sick. You make me want to puke. It says, I want to spit you out of my mouth. If you look at the translations, it actually means vomit. You make me sick. How's your life? How's your soul? How do you feel way deep down inside? Is the Holy Spirit there? You have something there that Jesus wants to rebuild? To light back up? Or does it make him sick? He says, remember, think back, in Sardis there was a little flicker of hope, a little flicker of light, maybe a little wisp of smoke coming out of the fire, out of the rubble. 
Jesus says, let's blow a little air on this. Let's put some kindling on this thing. Let's see what happens. See if the fire of life will come back. Think back to how it felt when you first loved Jesus Christ. Remember how it felt when you first accepted Jesus Christ and how it made you feel inside. Remember how you got there. Hang on tight to that and repent. What is repent? Turn around. Look to where the true joy comes from that fills your heart. Change your thinking. Change the things you listen to, the things you look at. Look Jesus square in the eyes and then obey. When you look Jesus Christ square in the eyes and then obey him, he will fill you with the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing else like it. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Thank you. Philadelphia. The city of love. Here's a letter to those who are doing things right. This is to those who have the joy of the Lord in their hearts. No matter what's going on around them, no matter what's being thrown at them, they're still looking to Jesus. They're hanging on tight to their faith. And they have the joy of the Lord. Their joy for Jesus Christ, their love for Jesus Christ shows no matter what the tribulation and the suffering they are going through. Can you say that? Does it show, does Jesus' love show in your life? No matter what's happening? We're all locked up because of this virus. We can't go nowhere. We're not supposed to hug anybody. We're not supposed to shake hands. But does the love of Jesus Christ still shine out of your life, out of your soul? <coughs> There's still ways to show people that Jesus Christ is love. That Jesus Christ still wants you. I can imagine that this church, the church of Philadelphia, wasn't too much worried about what they looked like to others. I can imagine they enjoyed coming together and praising and worshiping God, and they didn't care who heard it, who saw it, and how it looked. All they cared about was that it glorified Jesus Christ. They came together to praise and worship God. That's why when I asked the question, what, what are we here for? The response was to praise and worship God. It doesn't matter what it looks to anybody else. We are here to praise and worship God. To glorify Jesus Christ. This church believed that the Lord Jesus, they believed in the Lord Jesus, and they gave room for the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. They weren't concerned about trying to make things happen on their own. When the song was going wrong in the church, and they needed something in the church, what did they do? They prayed about it. Because they didn't have the money to, to throw at it. If they wanted a bigger congregation, they prayed about it. Because they couldn't build a bigger church. But they didn't care. I don't believe they cared. They're all about having the joy of the Lord and letting it shine. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. I would believe that this church was going through the same strifes that Sardis and all the others around them were going through. But they didn't cave into the pressures of false teachings. They stayed true to the scriptures. 
They stood on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. They believed every word that was in this book. They didn't just read parts of it to make themselves feel good. They accepted that sword when it sliced and diced. They humbled themselves and allowed Jesus Christ to heal it. They refused to compromise the truth and made sure not to step on other people's toes. I want you to notice something about what Jesus said to this church. There in verse 8. It's a New English translation. I know your deeds. Look, I have put in front of you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have a little strength, but you have obeyed my word and have not denied my name. I know you have little strength. Different commentaries talk differently about this scripture, about this verse. Some say, I have, you have little strength. Jesus is saying, yes, I know you're a little church. I know that you have problems. And that's why he opens the door for them. To make life easier for them. The other way of looking at this, they don't even look about, I know you have a little strength, but they look at the open door and what it means. What does the open door mean? Is it making space for the Holy Spirit to work? That God is opening doors so you can go out and witness? Jesus knows our every weakness, our every need. When it comes to living a life for Jesus, we have to ask ourselves, can we do it on our own, or do we need help? When are we the most effective in the work of the kingdom of God? When we allow Jesus Christ to be our guide, when we allow Jesus to open the door for us, we just need to be ready to go through the door when it opens. The Church of Philadelphia didn't have the, church, the riches of Laodicea, the history and heritage of Ephesus, the great reputation of Sardis, or the famed faithfulness of Samaria. A poor little church that everyone even overlooked except Jesus Christ. How often have we here felt like everybody overlooks us? We wish more people would come and see us. The thing is this. What brought Ellen and Roland in here? Just that they happen to be a good example. Something draw them in them back doors that first Sunday. But what was it that kept them here? What kept them coming back? We had the love of Jesus Christ. We didn't care what the world outside was doing. We just cared that we got together and praised the works of Jesus Christ and let our light shine out. Amen. That, my friends, is what it needs to be. We don't have to be a big church to praise and worship God. We don't have to be a big church to be witnessing to others. To show others the need of Jesus Christ. We just need to be ready when God opens the door to walk through it. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus says, I have opened the door for you. Jesus is the one who can make it all things possible when we allow him the room to work. I have a book, it's titled um, Making Room. I forget what it is for the Holy Spirit. Basically, what it's about is being ready and willing that when the opportunity arises to allow the Holy Spirit to work, when we are bringing someone to Christ, when we want to witness to someone, we have to be watching and we're ready and willing to allow the Holy Spirit to work when we see the opportunity. Do you need to be watching for that opportunity? And that's what Jesus, I think that's what Jesus is talking about when he says he opens the door for us. If we think we're too small to do any big work in the kingdom of God, have you forgotten the scripture that talks about something small that grows into something big? Exactly. The mustard seed. Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like the mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds. But when it has grown, it has the greatest garden plant and becomes a tree. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until all the dough had risen. That dough, when you're baking bread and you don't add yeast, it does not multiply. It just stays there. So what's it going to take for us to grow in Jesus Christ? We're going to have to add something. The Word of God. The yeast. If you don't read this thing, you'll be lost. Pretty soon I've talked enough about this and held this Bible up enough that I won't have to talk about it for a couple of weeks. But that's not going to happen. I guarantee you. You may be thinking, what can I do for Jesus Christ? I'm a nobody. What can this little old me do for Jesus? The question you ask yourself isn't what have I done for Jesus last year? That's looking in the past. The question needs to be what can I do for Jesus today? Have you asked yourself that this morning when you got out of bed? What can I do for Jesus today? Did you ask Jesus, hey, I don't know what you want me to do, but would you show me and help me along the way? Would you lead me? Would you open that door? Would you lead me through it? What can I do for Jesus this year? Or next year? When we are looking forward, we're more likely to see the open door and then trusting in Jesus, walking by faith. Jesus will not only open the doors, but He will lead us through those doors. The seven letters to the seven churches. There are things in each one that we can use to apply to our lives today. There are things in these, each of these letters that we can utilize to make our lives the way Jesus wants us to be. Each one says, he who has an ear, 
Let them hear what the Spirit says. My question, are you listening? Do you hear? I could spend a lot more time on these seven letters. I've only scratched the surface. Verse 20 says, listen, I am standing at the door and knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into his home and share a meal with him and he with me. Now some say this, this scripture isn't about us, a lost sinner and Jesus standing at the door. Notice the painting of Jesus Christ. There used to be a painting in, in the house growing up. And I don't know what happened to it. I, would, I, would let, I wish I had it. But it's a picture of Jesus standing in a door knocking. There's brush and stuff out around but this door. He's knocking. There's something missing on that door on the outside. There's no door knock. There's nothing there to open the door from the outside. Jesus is knocking. I have to open that door. You have to open that door. It's voluntary. Jesus doesn't bust it in. He can't come in unless you open it. promise of eternal life is yours only if you open the door and let Jesus in. Are you listening? Do you hear him knocking? Jesus promises to go come in and be with you if you open up. Think of the picture that has, that makes, that when you open that door and he comes in, what happens when he invites a guest into your house? You invite them in, you sit them down at the table, you offer them a cup of coffee or drink or iced tea, whatever, and then you sit down with them, and then what do you do? You talk with them. You fellowship with them. You commune with them. This is what Jesus Christ wants to do with you. He wants to come in. He wants to sit down. He wants to have this conversation with you. He wants to fellowship with you. Like good old friends, like little buddies. He wants to be your friend. We will dwell together in this place. That's what this is all about. If you don't know Jesus good enough, <coughs> if you think you don't know Jesus good enough, go back and read the book of John. This book is going to tell you all about him. <coughs> listen. Those that have the ear to hear, let them listen to what the Spirit says. Let us pray. 
terminis fase. I pray for, for our nation, this world. Help us, Heavenly Father, to this little church to be watching, be diligent in watching for those opportunities when Jesus opens the door that we can spread His love. Help us to be like a church in Philadelphia, a church of love. Help us to withstand all the persecution, the suffering. And we can stand on that solid rock and hang on to that faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rewards will be many. Pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.